madam head of the department, other faculty members of the PG Department of English, Bahrampur University, my first contact with you all. And I'm really happy to connect with you through this talk. Me too. Me too. Uh, 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 when I was uh, asked to deliver a talk a few days ago, I was a little apprehensive whether within such a short time I would be able to present anything sensible. Uh, I also then realized that actually the women in the world and certainly women in India and today being Women's Day are often called to work at far shorter notices than this. And uh, I then thought that this is really uh, unbecoming of my part to just say that I can't uh, present anything or speak to you. Uh, I also recollected that as, as a way of a preamble, if I may um, say, talk about the choice of my topic, that way back in 2004, I read a paper about Renaissance women writers in Nainital and uh, the, the then head and founder of my department, renowned scholar, Professor Avdesh Kumar Singh, who was the keynote speaker there, liked my paper and had asked me that, would you send it to the journal Critical Practice? And eventually after two years, Sometime in 2006, a paper of mine on this area was published in critical practice. Uh, Professor Tripathi uh, just mentioned my invitation from the Center for Women's and Gender Studies, University of British Columbia, Canada. Uh, incidentally, this paper of mine got noticed there and I was sent an invitation from the University of British Columbia in 2008, the Center for Women's Studies, uh, Women's and Gender Studies there. Uh, I still feel um, that a lot of work needs to be done in this area. As a matter of a preamble, let me also say that the Department of English and Comparative Literary Studies, Saurashtra University, Rajkot, where I am presently a professor and head right now, got the UGC SAP to work on Renaissance literatures, Indian Renaissance literatures in English, Hindi, and Gujarati way back in 2001, oblique two. And during the SAP program, when we got the SAP, we were one of the few English departments, certainly in Gujarat. We were the only department in Gujarat and very, very few department, English departments in the Western India to have got the UGC Special Assistance Program, SAP DRS. Uh, as part of the research on Renaissance, I got more and more interested in this area. And I started doing my own reading on this. And as a result, uh, whatever I present to you, whatever I, I wrote earlier and uh, uh, is, is as a result of this ongoing interest in this area, which again, as, as I reiterate, uh, there is a lot of work to be done. And as some of my slides might make it clear to you, um, you see the word, since we speak of Renaissance, and we all know that in Europe, Italy was the first place with the dawn of the Renaissance, where it was called La Renaissance, or the French word Renaissance, Renaissance, or I don't know whether I'm pronouncing it rightly. The English word uh, often used by critics like Matthew Arnold, Renaissance 
all mean rebirth rebirth and what struck me during my study about um, 15 18 years ago when i started working on this what what struck me was that this 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 field talking about rebirth flowering of knowledge learning art culture is suddenly severed off from the birth givers that is the women contributors and that actually started uh, my curiosity and interest to know uh, you will all agree probably that the first question for women or the feminist movement has always been the visibility or or the very simple question where are the women in important stages of cultural history civilizational history so my question was also the same that where are the women in this renaissance and that started in fact uh, my whatever humble knowledge journey of knowledge in this area and uh, this is a few things that i would like to share with you as a result of uh, of my ongoing interest uh, again i hope my slides and the slide changes are visible now properly this slide that i am presenting to you talks about the twofold yes, cult about women yeah so you can see that during the from the medieval period onwards whatever we know and even when renaissance began the pre-existing ideas about women were predominantly two and we are talking about the european context the first was as symbolized by eve and eve was supposed to have held a holy communion unholy communion uh, 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 with satan that is so so she also somehow was labeled with the evil and along with that there is another story about mary magdalene who was the sinner prostitute and jesus cured her again the the word evil and evil spirits are associated with mary magdalene so one association with women even today we hear news about women being branded as witches and they are tortured and and it, it's we still get to see such news clips in india even in the 21st century so one one uh, uh, idea associated with women was about that they are they are uh, on the side of the ev evil they are sinners uh, they are double sinners they are uh, temptresses and so on exactly di diametrically opposite is the other idea which is symbolized by virgin mother mary that is they are the most exalted they are the purest they are the women par excellence so in between these two diametrically opposite ideas about women the human women have also made their, their contribution the the women in flesh and blood the women like any other human beings especially like any other man they have also made their contributions and this is what uh, my my uh, talk is about uh, but again if we look at some of the very curious practices during uh, renaissance period coming coming on continuing from from the uh, medieval times you will find that wife beating was an accepted thing and a, a man was allowed to so called chastise his wife because she is part of his household and uh, we have examples like i have mentioned for example the taming of the shrew although uh, 
um, Shakespeare is actually critiquing the entire practice, but nevertheless presenting the quote unquote taming of the woman, of the shrew. And, and uh, scholars like Eileen Power have, have conducted their research and come to the, come to the conclusion that uh, socially, the devotion of a woman for her husband was equated with the fidelity of a dog for a master. Now, these, these are some of the parallels that were uh, very casually dropped. No, there was no problem when th these were equated in this manner. Um, and, and, and open public punishment of women went on during Queen Elizabeth's time also. When Queen Elizabeth was the Queen of England, that also happened there. And the institutions primarily uh, that formed ideas on women were two. The, the church, where generally celibate men formed the ideas about women, and the aristocratic class. They, they had the, all the means at their hand. They, they were uh, in the court. Uh, they were literate, educated. Uh, they had the means of airing their views with a lot of command. And they took certain things, their opinions, as if for granted. And they regarded the aristocracy generally regarded women as a subsidiary to their asset the land you will all uh, agree uh, and recollect that you know land was a primary resource during that time it is still real called real estate okay and and money paper currency is often subordinated even today to the real estate. So for aristocracy, the primary asset was land and their, their county, their kingdom often was ornamented with beautiful women. And so women were often ornamental and they were certainly subordinate to this primary asset, land. And as, as Eileen Power says, that it, it might with truth be said that the accepted theory about the nature and sphere of women was the work of the classes least familiar with the great mass of womankind. So these two institutions aired their opinions and ideas about women when in fact they were very little familiar with majority of the women. This is the dichotomy. This is the irony that you find. You will also, you might question that, well, with Renaissance came humanism, with humanism came ideas about educating women. So did humanism help? With whatever little finding that I have had, and I will mention a few texts also from uh, which I have borrowed my ideas and, and uh, they would be, the names uh, would be available to you. Uh, I think that in exceptional cases, education, in, in, in very rare cases, ed education came to women. Women could uh, avail of education. Uh, women were by and large denied education. Uh, so overall, education didn't impact much because, again, you see the goal of education for men and women were perceived to be different, absolutely. Men were in the public sphere, so uh, education would be aiding men, I mean, broadening his horizons, his intellect, make him more intelligent, would, would make him able to take powerful decisions. Whereas for women, education was associated with bettering herself, bettering her behavior, her morals, her values and principles. So it was a very private affair. It was a very, very, very limited thing with education for women. 
as an, an, in, in contrast to men. And I have two quotations, one by Erasmus and one by Thomas More. And uh, if I, 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 you see, you can underline certain things here. When Erasmus says, study busies the entire soul, it busies, it, it keeps busy the entire soul, it is not only a weapon against idleness, but also a means of impressing the best, best precepts upon girl's mind and of leading her to virtue. Okay, so again, the emphasis is, uh, the presumption is that, uh, that so that the girls do not remain idle, that is, they are generally idle. So let us educate them. And through that, let us remove their idleness and let us put in virtuous ideas which would lead to virtuous behavior. And this is Thomas More, by the way. The second one. If a woman of eminent virtue of mind, there is a big if, if, a woman of eminent virtue of mind should add even moderate skill in learning, I think she will gain more real good than if she obtained the riches of Croesus and the beauty of Helen. So once again, we were discussing just a, a little while ago that, that talking about women as part of assets, richness, uh, and of course there have been women associated with ornamental beauty and and so these two things again becomes very very stereotypical as you can see as against these humanists look at this lady's thoughts and here i'm entering into my my sharing uh, of significant women of the of the Renaissance, pre-Renaissance, and during the Renaissance. And, and this is Christine de Pizan, or Pizan, uh, 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 whose, whose voice we, we hear. She is one of the earliest women who supported herself and her family, especially after her uh, uh, husband's death. She supported herself and her, and her family through writing. She was uh, a, 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 a writer, an author of the court of King Charles VI of France. And then she was a, a court lady uh, as a writer, as, as an intelligent woman uh, in several courts of French dukes. And we have till now known, uh, I have always maintained, as have the, the women scholars who have dug up the works of the women, that when we speak of the works of women that we talk about, we always have to say, as of now, we know. Because more research might lead us to know more about them. So there, there is always a, a, a provisionality, not a finality to when we talk about the works of these ladies, these, these, these women. Uh, so uh, the works that we, we associate with Christine de Pizan is the book of the City of Ladies and the Treasure of the City of Ladies. And look what she is talking about. In the, in the previous, you saw Erasmus talking about girls' mind and virtue and this and that. And here is what she is opining. But if it were customary to send little girls to school and teach them the same subjects as are taught to boys, now, this is important. We still believe that certain subjects are not meant for girls. Engineering, for example, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering still is a predominant domain for men. We think that, oh, what, what would a girl do going into that area? So this is, this is 15th century Christine de Pizan talking about if it were customary to send little girls to school and teach them the same subjects as are taught to boys, they would learn just as fully and would understand the subtleties of arts and sciences. Sciences. 
if they indeed maybe they would understand them better she says if they understand them less it is because they do not go out and see so many different places and things but stay home and mind their own work she just stops short of saying that they are forced to stay home it is because they stay home because they are not allowed to go outside and gain exposure and there there is what she says for there is nothing that teaches a reasonable creature so much as the experience of many different things so uh, 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 girls are blinkered they have a very narrow view of exposure to life whereas men have everything the entire vast world and this is what she is saying that why can't girls be sent to schools and taught the same subjects that boys are so we just mentioned queen elizabeth and we said that even during her reign so a natural question might come so all this was happening and the women were marginalized and never thought of when they were really powerful women like queen elizabeth the first on the throne what was happening what was their role of ladies the such powerful ladies and you see this is a very interesting thing and i have given my citation from the norton anthology of english literature <laughs> volume 1 uh where it is mentioned this very interesting detail is mentioned that when queen elizabeth came to power the predominant idea was still that women cannot rule and why can't women rule because the faculty of rational thought the intellect was not in not there in women it it was absent in women what was there in women they 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 had emotions they had sentiments uh, feelings etc but rational thought proper intellectual decisions to run a kingdom that that was not there that that, that couldn't be there in women so what happened when elizabeth elizabeth a very intelligent lady and her trusted privy council as it was called and i have put two names there like like lord burley and francis walsingham and they they invented and spread since since women were only supposed to have emotions uh, they 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 invented what is called a cult of love an emotional cult and they associated it with the virgin mother mother mary and so the so virgin mother mary and the parallel virgin queen elizabeth mother mary's love for infant jesus is equated with queen elizabeth's love for her children the citizens and so this love however was not considered to be residing in the physical body the body natural but it was in the body politic that is in that faculty which uh, allowed her as a mother to manage or look after the well being of her children like actually in a household a mother does looks after the well being of her children this is the parallel that is drawn so the body natural is not so important but the body politic is the body natural is subject to failings like all flesh and blood is but the body politic was higher it transcended the body natural it was timeless it was perfect and in in political terms therefore elizabeth being a woman that did not matter that that was that was beside the point this is a very interesting thing but what you can see that that elizabeth as well as her privy council had to work through the existing notions or about women during that time they could work out something 
but they were still overwhelmingly pressurized by the 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 pre prevalent thought that women and rationality women and intellectual ideas cannot go together it is again such backdrop then when i said as as a personal question i had that where are the women of during the renaissance where are the women of the renaissance i was very pleasantly surprised and delighted when i first came across this essay by joan kelly and the name of the essay is exactly what i have titled this slide did women have a renaissance this essay is found in a late 1970s work edited by Bryden Thurl and Coons which is called very significantly becoming visible women in european history becoming visible so that's that's the crux of the thing where where is the visibility of women where are the women very simply put where are the women and it is there if you if you yourself if you start working in this area you will realize that all these works the works that i have put across or the works that you will come across you can you can uh, uh, frame them from the late 1970s onwards only 1970s onwards actually majority of the work this is a very early work by bredenthal and kunz 1977 majority of the work they start coming out from the 1980s now i am putting a few works here this is where i have borrowed my ideas this is where i have i have been helped for earlier also in my in my own personal research and and uh, these are the works for example this is a work in 1987 women writers of the renaissance and reformation edited by katharina wilson this is another work by margaret king uh 1991 women of the renaissance and this is by edited by marian wine or win davis 1999 women poets she is focusing on the exalted stature of poets if you look at from the earliest time there was a creator in heaven and the next creator on earth was a man the poet the poet was significantly a man the poet could not be thought like god the father could not be thought to be a woman similarly the creator on earth it was impossible to think that there could be women poets so this is a work especially on, on women poets of the renaissance and here are some renaissance women writers that within this short span of time that we have we can talk about a little bit i have uh, kind of arranged them uh, chronologically and uh, many of these dates i have put for example a question mark against isabella whitney please note that many of these dates by literary historian feminist scholars uh, there is a year there there is a year uh, in the uh, being born year of death and uh, and there is not a uh, really consensus on these years but more or less uh, these these there are these years so um, it is it is often better uh, to to say that we still have to know about the details more uh interestingly there are these classes of women for example we have the aristocratic class 
the working class, the women, hundreds of women who are nuns, who were nuns. There was this very small class of very talented, educated women, the courtesans. And again, working class, you can say lower middle, upper middle, both kind of working classes where Anna Bynes would, uh, comes from a, a, a tailor's family, a, a little lower middle uh, class. Isabella Whitney is slightly upper middle, so middle getting divided into lower and upper and the, and the country. It is interesting to say, for example, uh, here I mentioned, uh, for example, that we were talking about education, humanism, emphasis on educating women. You see, uh, aristocratic women could get education more freely if there was a supportive father, brother, husband. For example, uh, the, the, the quintessential Renaissance man, Philip Sidney, his sister Mary Sidney was equally well read. In fact, we know about Philip Sidney today because of Mary Sidney. When Philip Sidney died because of a battle wound, his study was full of scattered with his writings, papers. And we are talking about time when there are physical papers, not neatly put under documents and, and uh, things in the laptop or desktop where we have folders managed. And it is Mary Sidney who collated, brought together, made sense of it, and posthumously published works by Philip Sidney, because of which Philip Sidney is often known as a one a fountainhead of English criticism when we talk about England with his uh, defense of poesy, for example. Uh, so aristocratic women, for example, they, if they had support, support by men, uh, they had education. It was more difficult for the working class. They, they often had uh, to fight for education with their own initiatives. So um, for them, they might, they, it, is, it, is, it is more likely they rebelled against the men in their family to get education. For the nuns, uh, they were strictly, they had to be literate to a certain extent, but they were strictly monitored what they could read and what they could write. So again, very blinkered, uh, uh, very confined parochial uh, education we, we speak of about this class of women. The courtesans are like we have in India, Umrao Jan Ada, for example, highly talented poet, dancer, musician, and very beautiful. This is a class of women, a very small class of women where approximately approximately and I, I, I stress approximately uh, there is a modicum of a semblance of equality between the courtesan and her lord this is uh, uh, an, so it's an interesting class and 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 we are talking about I'll be taking um, uh, from uh, the fifth person here, um, Isabella Whitney. I, I think when, as students of literature, when we start knowing the Elizabethan period, Renaissance period, I don't know how many English departments teach Isabella Whitney. Uh, what do we know? How, my, how, how many of our students doing BA and know about Isabella, Isabella Whitney? Where, where is she put in the syllabus? Is she studied? Uh, she is mostly very frugally, if at all, researched upon. We know more about, for example, Afra Ben. Afra Ben, that too, because uh, uh, we, we know her from Virginia Woolf. Um, but Isabella Whitney is, again, still largely unknown. And uh, again, when was she born? When did she die? Still no idea. 
very sketchy idea. She is considered to be the first woman poet and professional writer. And yet we don't know much about when she was born, when she died. This much is now clear that she is the first English woman to have penned and published secular poetry, not religious poetry, secular poetry under her own name. She was brave enough to put her name. But how many works? We still have no idea. She was this daring woman when she ventured to live as a single woman in the city of London. And when she did so, there were only three avenues for single women or women basically for work. One, she could be a servant. There were many noble families, barons and lords and in their household, she could be a servant. She could be a street vendor selling different wares. Or she could be a prostitute, she could be a sex worker. And against this, this is this is a lady, she, she ventures to earn her living out of writing. And as we were just discussing that we have started coming to know about her from the from 1980s. The first proper critical attention on her was a work by Betty Travitsky in 1980. And this is interesting. There's, there is this woman, Kate Bradley, uh, a white woman, a young white woman who's writing in 2018 about her own experience of a single working woman, single working white woman, uh, uh, youngish white woman in London. In the 21st century, this is a 2018 writing. And she says, as night falls on London, the urban landscape becomes a no woman's land. To go out alone after dark is to take a journey through my own nervous system. Kate Bradley speaks about in London today, there are stalkers. In London today, there are rapists. And a young woman is not really safe on the streets of London during certain time in certain localities. So if this is true in 2018, we are talking about, you can see the dates there. Isabella Whitney's canonical texts, right now there are three. Look at the longish title, the copy of a letter, epistolary mode of writing, the copy of a letter lately written in meter by a young gentlewoman to her unconstant lover. Emphasis on gentlewoman, otherwise people will not read. Then a sweet nosegay or pleasant posy. Nosegay is a bunch of flowers, uh, posy flowers, and so her poems is a bunch of fragrant flowers. Uh, the lamentation of a gentlewoman upon the death of her late deceased friend, William Griffith, gentleman. Gentlewoman, gentleman. These are some of the texts and the, the, the title themselves are so evocative and, and uh, open to interpretations. And as I mentioned that Critics have found that Whitney's writings, they, they, they cover a whole range of things. For example, social realism, including what later on, for example, William Blake would write, up, write about the prisons in London in his famous poem, London, for example. There were public punishments, including public hanging during Whitney's time in London. And then there were all the so many women put into mental asylums. Discipline and punish by Foucault immediately comes to mind how women and men, they are branded as unhinged, mad, and then you can put them into asylums. 
Whitney's writings also reveal her great angst against the disparity of wealth that one finds in the cities. But she's also living in the city has made her very sharp about the economic transactions, the commercial transactions of the city. Uh, she also reveals a, a strong Christian Protestant strain in her writing. She identifies with the marginalized and the dispossessed. And she also is a good craftswoman. That is, when, when she is she is writing Ovidian and Petrarchan love poems, she is actually undercutting their way of writing and she is radicalizing the form. So we can, we can see, I think, uh, if some people start getting interested in Isabella Whitney, then such talks would would have its its goal uh, uh, concluded kind of a thing that it would be worth it if people take up young young people take up knowing about such writers i come to this uh, very very respectable honest courtesan as she was called gaspara stampa venetian courtesan who was as i mentioned as is, is often considered probably the greatest Italian woman poet to have come out till now. At the age of 31, she dies. I wrote more than 300 poems. You, you see, this is, this is the problem. More than 300 poems can be 301 poems and more than 300 poems can be 425 poems also. That is more, also more. But how many more? This is an approximation. We say, oh, she produced more than 300 poems. And, and um, again, published most of them, published posthumously. And, and she, she was a musician. She, she uh, set poems to tune. And, and she sang her poems. And, and she and her sister and her brother they, where, where they stayed, they were the toast of the Venetian, sophisticated Venetian society. And so this is, this is a lady where her poems, she was obviously a courtesan, which means she was uh, associated with a count. And uh, the count um, felt that war was more important than love. So... Gaspara Stampa's poems have all the nuances of especially unrequited love. You, you can find all the nuances, obsession, desire, jealousy, frustration, loneliness, anger. And again, she's very conscious of the masters like Petrarch. And, and she brings about a variation in the sonnet form when she writes. And Gaspara Stampa is identified as, as one of the initiators of the, or in Italy was called the sweet new style of writing poetry, the Dolce Stil Nuovo, sweet new style of writing poetry. And, and, and what was, what must have been blasphemous when she was writing, what she did through her poems is that she equated the beloved, that is the man, you see, when we talk about love poems, the lover is generally the man. But first thing she, she does is to invert that. The lover is the woman. The beloved is the man. So the beloved is equal to God. Now this we find, for example, we are reminded of a certain bhakti poems where, where, where God is a friend, where God is a beloved, sakha. This is the kind of a thing which at that point of time when she was doing it must have been really problematic. And also she hierarchizes the love of the lover, the woman. Or on the grounds that she has the purest of all emotions and that is love. The purest of all emotions is available only to the woman. On the basis of which she, is, she hierarchizes the woman over Men. I mention a nun, Saint Teresa of Jesus, 
who was as as we mentioned is wrote like so many other nuns under the strictest monitoring of the church fathers and therefore many of the writings that the nuns wrote had implicitly the 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 acceptance that women are sinners and so on yet her writing reflected upon this problematic thing called sainthood what what does it when 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 human beings turn into saint what does it mean how is the process what happens especially when she knows from her own experience that hundreds of young women come to the nunneries they are they are women they are very poor women at such a time at such an age where it is very natural to like food like dresses when it is so natural to have desires what is it to come to a nunnery what is it to you know give up what what is it to renounce you know the possessions and therefore her writing this tension of 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 this walking on this narrow difficult path of piety or surrendering oneself to god what is this thing this 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 tension that uh, uh, she reflects in her writing this is which, which is very remarkable and and she would often talk about in 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 very homely similes of gardening and watering the plants and such things to describe the interaction between a human being and and the divine force uh, her famous works are, are are as of now four the book of life the way of perfection book of foundations and the dwelling places of the interior castle this is this is really this has become very famous this is as i said anna binds comes from a, a tailor family as a lower middle class and she is a very well known woman uh, uh, in in europe who was part of the catholic counter reformation she held very strong opinions against martin luther she coined the word luthery she accused martin luther of being a wolf in a sheep's garb and and her lifelong mission was to impart education to working lower middle class lower class working class women and this brings us actually and i am almost towards my the end of my time it's coming to be 130 victoria colonna an aristocratic lady a friend of michel angelo one who has been mentioned by the great uh, in the in the great work ariosto uh, ariosto mentions in orlando furioso she had she held a relationship of a friend with michel angelo and uh, with so many poems and so on if uh if i may read out now just a few things and end my talk in a literary manner i think it would be proper here is what ariosto talks about he wonders when he is to write about women whom how many shall he choose and then he says i will choose only one but will so choose that envy will be entirely confounded for none of the others will be troubled if i pass over them and praise this one alone this woman has not only made herself immortal with a sweet style that has not been surpassed but whomever she speaks or writes about she can draw from the tomb and give and give eternal life victoria colonna was a patron of artists also by the way and this is what ariosto writes uh, about her victoria colonna um, when when michelangelo has to reflect upon his friendship what does he say about victoria colonna let's look at this 
a man within a woman no rather a god speaks through her mouth look at again the 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 way he he starts with a man within a woman and then he corrects no rather a god but again god is an entity who is a male speaks through her mouth and then he says and i having heard her am no longer my own master so with these poetic words i would like to bring my talk to a close uh keeping within time and if there are observations comments questions i shall be happy to take them thank you very much thank you sir thank you so much for sharing who are majority of my audience ma'am uh well uh, there are people from uh, uh i think all over odisha and some people from outside of odisha and here you can see my students here in this room hi so they are say hello yeah. and give a big hand to a brilliant lecture i i hope you enjoyed i hope it made some sense to you all they did they definitely did and it was very very interesting because their knowledge of renasa is limited to the stereotypical reader, uh, writers that we read and yeah. so i uh, all of them were taking down notes and they were wrapped in attention thank you so much professor mukherjee for this brilliant brilliant talk and you, uh, we all enjoyed it there are professors from sambalpur university listening to you some from west bengal professor sabita tripathi from sambalpur university she is here and professor aloka patel is also here so um, would you like to ask a question or something professor tripathi uh, sabita tripathi would you like to make a comment or something well, uh, thank you suti thank you uh, i congratulate all women of the world on this uh, international uh, day of celebration It's a women's you, day, uh, and uh, I congratulate Professor Mukherjee for delivering such an illuminating lecture. And that too, the first lecture by um, yeah, I should not uh, yeah. <laughs> call it gender discrimination. <laughs> <or male. laughs> Actually, thank you for including uh, yeah, me as the first speaker. <laughs> We do not want. gender discrimination because we need the male and the female for creation yeah. uh, i am i am aware of that this is a post feminist stance that we are taking beyond yes, sir, yes, compartments yes, I, that is why you are the first speaker of the day sir you must have thank yeah, you that's the thing that's why i congratulate you sir because uh, uh, you have empowered the women by <laughs> inaugurating the lecture inaugurating the session and really sir um, um is really uh, you know let the students participate uh, they are the real women who are going to uh, preside over other 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 uh, i mean other programs and uh, um, let the student participate sir um, and thank you uh, thank you ma'am thank you very thank you. much thank you very much sir i am a little bit sick that's why uh, i'm not able to talk oh, for oh, a please long please time. get well soon please get well soon ma'am thank you sir thank yeah. you thank you for uh, giving an opportunity to every all women of odisha to listen to you all universities you know there are members from all the universities of odisha oh so, thank you it's 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 my privilege uh, my yeah, privilege thank you bye it is our privilege to have you on board here sir thank you so much for agreeing to talk within such a short time and it was a brilliant lecture our students want to know something that yes, why were the women of the renasa not allowed to use their names and how could some become bold to use their names uh, when they were writing and were these poems published uh, posthumously or during their lifetime and how did the society take it okay uh, as i uh, gave uh, the chart of the classes of women Uh, it was easier for women of the aristocratic class to take their name 
uh, and and write under their name it was more difficult for people like anna bynes for people like uh, isabella whitney to take their name you see uh, naming and in naming or labeling people have been discussing this aspect that the 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 religious institution church names you right or, or it 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 used to okay so that also is given especially it is also given to women and therefore uh, since uh, as we just discussed writing creating uh, uh, is 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 only a male creator is the idea of of a creator so uh, therefore even people like george eliot had to uh, you know take a name so this is something that we have to uh, uh, really ponder upon why exactly they, they did it because it was the practice that probably if you take your own name you might be severely criticized you might be punished and you would not be read point is that you are writing to get a readership but if you write that a, a, a woman's name probably you will not get any readership because most of the readers most of the literate people were men again that also we have to see today from the readers respect point of view readers response theory point of view so most of the readers most of the literate were men so they they would also like to read men so this was a conditioning at that point of time against which gradually some women could still fight and come out this is what i can say thank you sir there is another question from the students that uh, they are reading hamlet at the moment Correct. so the first year students so uh, then um, well the queen was in power queen elizabeth how could yeah. shakespeare write frailty thy name is woman and get away with it <laughs> very good very good i think students ought to ask these questions Uh, that is why you will see i brought in elizabeth in my in my discussion elizabeth actually could rule because she had a very good small loyal group of men with her her privy council included a, a, a committed men with her so the the prevailing notion of what women were capable of doing or what way they could do you you see if you read the history just before uh, elizabeth her own sister is 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 called murderous mary right she she is so uh, so that that sets an example that uh, women actually cannot rule women are incapable of ruling and and uh, that was the prevailing notion now shakespeare coming to shakespeare uh, shakespeare often critiques the prevailing notion he does not don't take it that when he writes it he is asserting it or he is underlining it you see look at look at his look at his portrayals of women for example when we say since you are talking about hamlet what is hamlet's major problem hamlet cannot understand the behavior of his mother why is his mother so soon after the death of his father why has she married his uncle now that he can understand somebody's death father is a father figure can die he is a university wit but he cannot understand the behavior of his mother now sometimes dear students you have to read through silences also not what is written but what is not written now if if we if we ask if i as a teacher or if your teacher asks you was hamlet's mother happy as a wife it is not mentioned but why did she so quickly marry the uncle probably she was given more respect more love more care by the uncle than the husband maybe the husband maybe the husband took her for granted okay so there are certain things that shakespeare is great in his silences or reading between the lines we have to ask such questions also 
uh, uh, and when we read Shakespeare. But uh, excuse me, sir. Do you think that uh, murderous Mary was uh, the um, kind of you know um, idea behind Shakespeare's uh, Lady Macbeth? Oh, but uh, okay. So that is one way of looking at it. Yes. Um, uh, another way of looking at it is uh, um, some of the women, Renaissance women poets, and especially, uh, say, Victoria Colonna, uh, through her poems, they say that war is created by men. And if we remove men from important positions, there would be no war, there would be peace on earth, and there would be prosperity. So what probably probably Shakespeare might be also thinking is that why do we say that that only men can murder? Why can't women murder? Why can't women things in, take things into their hand and, and be strong to the extent of removing obstacles to murder? So this can be another interpretation that that you can think of. Yeah, that's the silence that we can uh, talk yeah. or we can try to interpret. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for giving us so much of your time. Uh, uh, are there any more questions? Anyone? Oh there is there is a question on GB Shaw and feminism and okay. I mean, certain things are right now not within the, the scope of our talk. Uh, 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 Ibsen, GB Shaw, well, feminism can brought in anywhere oh. and there are so many women scholars here i would like to have certain answers from them or <laughs> let, let this let this discussion continue writers and their opinion about women uh, canonical writers for example uh, we, we we are these days we are talking even about uh, how t.s Eliot was anti-jew for example or uh, what kind of opinion that that he held about women uh, uh, so on and so forth. So it, this this would start us looking at literature from the other perspective also, and that that would serve the real purpose. Thank you so much. Um, I think you have answered most of the questions. Uh, participants, do you have any questions to ask? Our students are all here, and they would like to say a big thank you to you, sir. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. All the best to you. So we'll have you here after the pandemic is over. Please oh, it would, it to our department. Yeah. It would be an honor for us. Yeah, yeah. We would have an exchange. Certainly, we would like you to also come here. Thank you so much.